Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and uh, continue looking at Daniel chapter 11. Just kind of briefly go over verse 29 and see where we're going to go today. I, I've been trying to figure it out. I don't really know. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Now, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are, are thankful for all the things that you show us uh, from your word that reveal to us our need of you and your power and your love and you're working in our lives. And we pray for those that are searching for truth. We know, Lord, that um, there's many things that, that we have struggled with, and we know that others struggle to understand your word. Uh, but we just pray for your spirit to, to work in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds, and that as we open your word together here this morning, that you can teach us, that you can instruct us, that you can correct us. Uh, be with us now through thy spirit. And we also pray for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so, so yesterday we had gone through Daniel 11, verse 29. Now, Dwight wasn't here. Stephen was. And, and Stephen said he had a hard time sort of putting this all together. You know, it's um, I've, I've tried to figure out the simplest way to explain it. So I'm just going to review it really quickly here, just in as much simplicity as we can have. So we know that in Daniel chapter 11, that it's it's part of a, vig- a vision that begins in chapter 10 and uh, continues to the end of chapter 12. And. In the past, when we would look at Daniel 11, we would think, well, this is just talking about this history in between the time of, you know, Daniel, basically going up to, uh, you know, the time of the end, right? So going up to 1798 and, and to 1989. And then, of course, after that, right? So all that, that history, the end of the world. Now, we've come to understand that Daniel... Uh, chapter 11 is addressing Daniel 8 and 9 more in particular. That is the 2300 days of the 2300 evenings and mornings. That is the Mara, the vision of the evenings and mornings and the Dabar. That is uh, the vision of Daniel chapter nine, the 70 weeks, which addresses the going forth of the commandment. So, so Daniel has an understanding of that. He has an understanding of the start of these prophetic periods. And the context here is really further understanding of the chazon. That is, he needs to understand what was what was addressed in Daniel 8.13. How long shall be the vision concerning the daily uh, and the transgression of desolation to give the, both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And this is not well understood by Seventh Day Adventists. That is, we don't have a much of an understanding of uh, the daily, um, the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation. We understand the connection between them, and them also being connected with the indignation and how the the time of the end, the end of the indignation, is connected to October twenty two, eighteen forty four. That is, we don't fully understand Millerite history as Seventh-day Adventists. And that's what Daniel is, Daniel 11 is addressing, Daniel 11 and 12. And you can see that when you get to Daniel 12, 7, it's going to talk about the 1260 years of the daily. Uh, it's going to talk about the 1290 and the 1335 as well. So the latter parts, it's going to deal with that transition from paganism to papalism. It's going to cover the history of, of Greece and, um, well, Persia, Greece, and Rome, pagan and papal. So there, there's so many things in uh, Daniel chapter 11 uh, that we hadn't really noticed. That is, we, we knew this basic idea, but we didn't see how they all fit together. And, and I really think that there is this, this narrative that flows once you understand the purpose of Daniel chapter 11. Uh, the ideas flow a lot better as you move through Daniel 11. Now, of course, you know, we've all studied Daniel 11 in the past. I mean, I studied Daniel 11 
many, many times on, on different levels. I've read uh, Uriah Smith's uh, book on Daniel on Revelation. I've presented studies on it, uh, going through some of it. Um, obviously, in this movement, we studied Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. And we've spent a, a, a number of different studies that we did. We spent a lot of time on them. Uh, dealing with Daniel chapter 11 back in 2020, we did a study. And now we're doing this study again. And, and I've presented so many studies on it. But each time we look at Daniel chapter 11, we notice things that we didn't notice. You know, one of the things is we notice that it's going to talk about the crucifixion of Christ in Daniel chapter 11. And the purpose of Rome, that Rome has to be the power that establishes the vision, because it is about uh, what's going to happen at the end of the 70 weeks. It's going to be Rome that's going to be there, right? Rome is uh, this power that's going to crucify Christ. And so that's not going to happen with Persia, with Medo Persia or Persia. And, and it's not going to happen with, uh, with Greece, but it is going to happen with Rome. You know, one of the things too is in, in, uh, Daniel 11 verse 14 when it says, they, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. We know that that's the chazon. So one of the things that, that we talked about here is that Daniel chapter 11 is addressing that chazon, right? That's the 2520. Now, when we think of the 2520, we think of them as two 2520s. But that's not really co correct. I mean, it is correct in, in, in one way. I mean, there are two different periods of 25, 20 years. But neither of them exists on their own. They're not two separate 25, 20s that are unrelated to each other. Uh, they are related to each other. And, you know, my view, my understanding of Leviticus 26 is that there is not a 25, 20 year period specifically or explicitly uh, referenced there without any relationship to the prophetic periods that are addressing literal Israel. That is, in order to get a 25, 20 out of Leviticus 26, you can't just simply take the word seven times, make it into seven years, and multiply it by 360. And, and we think people, many people think that that's what Miller did. But it's actually not what Miller did. How did Miller understand the word seven times? Why did he multiply it by 360? What did he think the seven times was? And that, that's, it's not a very good question. Would we say that that's a structure of seven prophetic years? Okay. So how about seven sabbatical years? Okay. So so Miller understood, because when he writes about the 2520, he's going to have this paper, uh, the typical Sabbath in the Great Jubilee, right? This paper. And, and he understands that the sabbatical and jubilee cycle is related to the prophetic periods. One of the reasons why he, he looked at the end of the prophetic periods as in the fall of 1843, back in um, May of 1843, suggests that it be in the fall, is because he understood uh, that there's a jubilee that's connected to the 10th day of the seventh month, and he was looking for uh, periods to end in connection with the jubilee. And this was picked up by Samuel Snow when that time passed in the fall of 1843, Samuel Snow continued to study and he came to the conclusion that they were just off by a year and that that the year that's talked about doesn't end in the spring. Right. So when they started moving it to the spring, he says, no, this year ends in the fall. And, and that's the initial idea that Samuel Snow had. But the point is that he understood it not as seven times and you take the word times and that's years. And then you take, you know, that and multiply it by 360. He understood that even though he didn't have, you know, an understanding of Hebrew, but he understood enough to know that that seven was a symbol. Now, he didn't apply four different periods of 70 years or three periods of 70 years and one of 140 years. 
um, to those periods. He didn't connect it as we did later on. So there's things that he didn't see. But the thing that he didn't do is he didn't say the word times there should be just years and that we're just going to multiply times. You are going to say that times is 360 years a day for a year. So he, he didn't do that. He didn't take, uh, take it that way, even though it seems like he did. But he understood that there was some steps in between there. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't just, he didn't really show his, his work, so to speak, as clearly as people would like. So people often have this objection. Well, you know, the times is not really part of the text. It's, it's just sevenfold. Um, and so, you know, fold isn't a year. And so you can't take, you know, a prophetic year that's 360 days and then, you know, multiply that and, you know, turn that into years, right? But that's not really what Miller did. Now, I know this is kind of roundabout here, but the point is that when we look at the time of the end and the time appointed, that they are connected, that on the 1843 chart, you have those 45 years, and those are part of that structure. That's the 1290 and the 1335. And, and that's going to bring you to the first day of the first month in 1844. The 1335, that's blessed is he that waiteth and cometh until the, the 1335 days. And that's going to be the end of the 1335 days, obviously not the beginning of it. And from there, we would count 187 days to the 10th day of the seventh month. So we have this symbol that we use for July 18, 187. And, and that becomes part of this structure. So, yeah, I said I'm doing something simple, but I'm just trying to to give this this background information for what's being addressed here. So what's being addressed is the Kazon. That is, Daniel has understanding of the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. He doesn't have understanding of the Kazon. Why not? Why doesn't he have an understanding of it? He has understanding of the thing, the Debar. He has understanding of the vision. Why am I saying he doesn't understand the Kuzo? Why is the, why is Ch Daniel chapter 11 specifically in, in chapter 12 as well? Giving him an understanding of the Kuzo. And, and how do I know that he doesn't? I mean, it says he has an understanding of the Debar and of the Marath. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Because we know that, that Rome has to exalt itself to establish the Kazon. So why does he not have an understanding of the Kazon? And it's going to, in Daniel, it's going to mention the Kazon in 8 verse 1 to uh, 2, verses 1 and 2, 8 13, 8 15. It came to pass when even I, Daniel, had seen the Kazon and sought for the meaning. And then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. So, so he's looking for the meaning of the Kazon. In 826, the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. That is the vision of the, that's the Mara. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, the Kazon, for it shall be more, for many days. So in 826, he knows that this, there's this Kazon, but it's going to be shut up. Its understanding is not going to be there. Right. So so he sees this Kazone, but he doesn't really understand it yet. Right. And and the 70 weeks, one of the things they do is they seal up vision and prophecy. And the vision there is the Kazone in Daniel 9, uh, 24. And and in, in Daniel 9, 23, the angel comes to him after his his prayer. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the, the debar, that is the matter that's going to be presented to him, the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, and consider the vision, right? So that vision there is going to be uh, the marah, right? So he's going to consider uh, uh, the bar that is, and and oh, um, pardon me, the vision, the marah, the 2300 days. So he's going to consider the commandment, the debar, and its relationship to the 2300 days, to the Marat. So in chapter 10, it says he's going to understand both of those. He's going to understand the matter and the Marat. But he doesn't have an understanding 
of the Kazon. So then the next time Kazon shows up in Daniel is 11 verse 14, that Rome shall exalt itself to establish the vision. And that vision is the Kazon. So can Daniel have an understanding of the Kazon without an understanding of the two periods of 1260 years? Because he knows that the 2300 days are going to end at the time that, that, that it's going to be in connection with the end of the prophetic periods, right? So he has, he has, he has an understanding about the 2300 days that it's going to, it's going to be connected to the 70 weeks. But Daniel is writing before any of these things happen. That is, now he may know that the 2520 starts sometime with the captivity of Israel. But he's not going to have a full understanding of this in order to for. And it's not so much about Daniel. It's about us. Is it was it would it be possible for for people in, you know, in the Persian period to know when the when the Kazone is going to end? Because we're given a starting point for the twenty three hundred days in the 70 weeks. Once those things happen and then they are fulfilled, the 70 weeks is fulfilled. We then have some understanding about the 2520. You understand what I'm getting at? That there are things that have to unfold in order for Daniel to have an understanding of them. And, and so he can have these prophecies about it. But Rome has to exalt itself to establish the vision. And so if you look at these verses, so I'm, I'm just going to try to help you here to sort of think this through. So here we get... Rome exalting itself to establish the vision. We're going to have the end of Greece and the beginning of Rome. And that vision is the Kazon, not the vision of the evenings and the mornings. Right? It's going to be these visions of the two desolating powers. Now, Rome has to exalt itself in order for this a vision to be established. Now, that word established just means to stand, right? To be appointed, to be confirmed. It's authenticating or establishing this vision, this period of time that is the Kazone. And so then we have all of this history of Rome, right? So Rome's going to come in at the time that we're going to have th these final battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, the battle of, of Phineum. It's going to go through that a little bit. And Rome coming into place. Right? And then it's going to talk a bit about the history of Rome in relationship to what happens with Christ. Right. So we're going to have um, these different Caesars. Right. Uh, Augustus and Tiberius and so forth. And, and Julius Caesar is going to talk about as well. And then it's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, which it talks about in Daniel chapter nine. Right. That's the arms of the flood shall be overflowing. From before him, and he shall be broken, yea, the prince of the covenant. And then it's going to go back and show this league that was made, the Jews made this league with Rome, and how it affects uh, the end of Rome, and then the rise of the papal power, right? So it's going to, it's going to address the start of Rome and the end of Rome. And then the rise of the papal power is going to happen uh, with the fall of Rome in Daniel 11, verse 30. So it's addressing this history for a purpose. It's not simply, you know, giving us some curiosities or, or just telling us about some things that happen to show that it's prophecy. It's prophecy, prophecy with a very clear purpose. It's giving a history that's going to be repeated. So it's using this hip history uh, tip typologically. And uh, it's going to talk about uh, this, uh, you know, the Battle of Actium. It's going to talk about the fall of Rome. But in between those, it's going to talk here, at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but, shall not, but it shall not be as the former as, as the latter. So verse 29 talks about this time appointed that he didn't mention in verse 27. And, and it's going to talk about what happens in this alliance between Antony and um, Octavian that um, it says, you know, both these kings and both these kings shall be 
and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, right? That is, they both have the same goal. They want to control the world. And they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. So obviously that, that lead between them breaks down. But then it says, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So the, the end at the time appointed here is 1798 to 1844. And the word yet just means an iteration, that it's going to occur again. So what's going to happen at the time appointed is not just that it's happening again of what had happened earlier, but it's actually the end of all of this. It's going to be the end of Rome, not just pagan Rome, but papal Rome as well. But it, it hasn't given you those details yet. Okay. Because that's not going to be till verse 31. So then it says, uh, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. And then it says, then shall he return to his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So this is addressing what happens with after the fall of Egypt and then what's going to happen in this persecution of Jews and Christians. And then he's going to return into his own land. And then it says at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So that was the verse that we had addressed. And um, we're saying that this time appointed can't be 1798 because it's the king of the north coming against the king of the south. And so we looked at that and we couldn't get it to work. And so we've taken the position that this is the time appointed that is the repeat of the time appointed talked about in verse 27. And, and so that's going to bring us to the time of the end, which is 1989. And that's what happens in 1989. The king of the north comes toward the king of the south. But here it says, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So I know this is a review of yesterday, but um, but we're just going to look at this again and then see where we move from here. So we had three possibilities, and or yay, four, right? But the fourth, we, we have to say it's not correct. So at the time appointed in 1989, the papacy in the USA, the king of the north, shall return. So this is the king of the north coming again toward the south. He shall return, and he's going to come toward the south. So this is Daniel 11, verse 40b, not Daniel 11, verse 40a. But it shall not be as the former, that is, the fall of Egypt in 30 BC, in that it is a spiritual north and south and not literal, or as the latter. That is, which means Western, that is the fall of Western Rome from 410 to 476, in that it is not pagan literal Rome, but papal spiritual Rome. So here we're just saying that uh, North and South are not literal, they're spiritual, and Rome is not literal, but spiritual, not pagan, but papal. Okay, so that's one interpretation that we could use of that, that passage. Nothing wrong with this interpretation. It's sort of the first one that I had, um, because what's going to follow is the fall of Western Rome in verse 30. And we just addressed the fall of Egypt in, in the preceding verses. But then we looked at it again, and we said, well, we could have it that uh, the latter and the former uh, are different, that while it is the fall of Egypt, it would still be the former. But the latter is not referring so much to the fall of pagan Rome, but to the fall of papal Rome. So it's just a different Rome. And, and it's just the fall of spiritual Rome, not addressing the fall of literal Rome, right? That is pagan. So here, it's just saying that it's not, it's not like the latter. So we know that the latter is going to be the fall of Western Rome. So um, here we're, we're going to say that the latter is... Uh, 1798. So it's the fall of the papal world. So, and, and so it's not going to be, so in the fall of papal Rome, or it, the difference is that north and south are reversed. So that, that's really the main difference here. So it's not addressing so much the spiritual and literal when we address the latter here as being 1798, but it's addressing the fact that the north and south are reversed. And, and so it's just saying that Daniel 11, verse 40, A and B 
are these two different times of the ends. And the one in 1989 is like that, except that the North is going to defeat the South, not the South defeat the North. So, so that, that one works just fine as well. So I have nothing wrong with that. I can't think of how that could be wrong, how either of these two options could be wrong. But when I like, the thing I like about the first one is that it connects it to the fact that we're going to have the fall of literal Rome. But even in the second one, we are going to have the fall of, of papal Rome being addressed later. So it's going to address both the fall of pagan Rome and papal Rome in the following verses. Right. It's going to bring us up to a 1798. So I have no problem with that. Now, the thing is, when I look at the Hebrew, I, I prefer the translation uh, of the latter part of the verse, but the latter shall not be as the former. So instead of it shall not be as the uh, former or as the latter. Well, that is a possible translation. This is the most likely at the time appointed. He shall return and come towards the south. But the latter shall not be as the former. Now, in this case, what it's saying is that the latter is going to be the one in 1989, the time appointed in 1989, and the former is the one that was in 1798. And so it's going to be the same, except the difference is north and south are reversed. So this one just basically is is using that, the idea that the latter is not like uh, the former. Right, where the other one says it's not like the former or the latter, right? So you can see it, it has the same information that's, that's essential to understand the difference between 1798 and 1989. So again, I have no problem with this interpretation. Now it's, it's my preference based on my understanding of the Hebrew. And I just think it's a much more natural reading, but the other readings are fine. They don't, they don't, none of these contradict one another. They all give us the same information, just looking at it from a different perspective. Now, if we try to apply it where the, this is talking about 1798, well, in 1798, the king of the north does not return and come against the king of the south. So, so this one doesn't work. Any questions on this before we move on? Why are you, why were you placing this with the north and the south being reversed? Uh, in 1989? Right. Well, because the uh, the former is 1798, where the king of the north is going to be taken captive by the king of the south. In 1989, the king of the south is the one that loses. Okay. So, so it's just simply that there are two times appointed that are mentioned. The one is Daniel 11, verse 40a in verse 27. And in verse 29, it's Daniel 11, verse 40b. And it's just going to tell us that this repeat of history, that the second part of Daniel 11, verse 40b, is, is different in that it's the, 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 whoever who's winning the battle is reversed. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, I'm just, I was asking to, to try to understand so that I'd be able to fit all this together. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so each one of these tells us basically the same information. You know, you can say... One tells us more and one tells us a bit less, but it's, it's, they're all in agreement. There's nothing that's contradictory between those three interpretations. Daniel 11 verse 29, if we say that the time appointed is 1798, well, I can't see how that applies. You know, the papacy doesn't come towards France, right? France comes towards the papacy. And then trying to say how it's not like the former is the latter. Well, you know, it, could kind of work, but the thing is, it, it doesn't. The, the whole verse doesn't work in interpreting it that way. Now, we know that Uriah Smith deals with the time appointed as the end of the 360, right? So so he has a different interpretation on it. So, so now that we have those verses and we look at verse 30, so this is just going to address the fall of pagan Rome. But it shows at that time that pagan Rome is going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So we know that pagan Rome doesn't really fall in the way that, that like Rome does not end, right? Rome continues. Now we know Western Rome technically falls, but the papacy takes it over. 
And, and so that transition from paganism to papalism is described in the next verse. The taking away of the daily and the giving of the abomination of desolation. So this is when arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. They shall take away the daily and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Now, we haven't put in the present truth application of this verse. Now, the verse above, so if we go to, to verse 29, I said that we can't put a present truth application in this verse. That is, it is the present truth. The only thing we could parallel it to, and maybe maybe we should look at that, is you know where it says, at the time appointed, November 9th, 1989, he, the papacy of the USA, the king of the north, shall return and come towards the south. But the latter shall not be as the former, in that the north and the south are reversed. So one of the things we noticed is we have uh, these way marks uh, that address the king of the north and the king of the south in our history. And we call them what? What are the, what are the way marks that we mark? where we say the king of the south defeats the king of the north, and then the king of the north defeats the king of the south. What, what, what do we call those waymarks? What's the name we give to them? Paniam and Raphia. Okay, so you've got Ra- Raphia and Paniam, right? And we, we've come to understand. So one of the things that we saw that I, I'm kind of, it's kind of odd that we didn't really see this before. At least I don't, I don't remember seeing it until we started doing this study on Daniel 11, is that, 1798 is Raphia, and 1989 is Paneum. We, we come to see that now, that that's what they are. Uh, but we have them as way marks in our line. That is, when we look at them in our line, they are a repeat of history. Right. So, so, we, so 1798 and 1989 repeat in our history within our line as what we call Raphia and Paneum, and we, we mark them as midnight in the midnight cry. OK, so that's that's where they are. And so we know that we have this line, which we've had since 2016 of 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday long. And we kept talking about, you know, we're approaching midnight and then we would have some event. We'd pass it. We said, well, that was midnight. The midnight cry is coming. November 9th, 2019 was supposed to be uh, the midnight cry for the priests. But then it was supposed to be, you know, midnight for the Levites. Right. So there was going to be this north and south and the north and south have to be to be, uh, you know, the United States and Russia again, like it was in 1989. But that wasn't really consistent. Right. So we and, and Jeff eventually abandoned that. So so as we move through this history, we're trying to address these these waymarks. And we can even mark uh, January 6th, uh, 2021, the siege of Washington. We can, we can mark it as the Battle of Raphia, but it's still not the midnight on the line that Jeff had back in 2016. And we've come to see that, that, that way mark called midnight is a little bit more elusive. And what are, what is it that we're expecting then with this way mark of the actual midnight way mark that we, we labeled as Raphia? So what is it that we're expecting midnight to be like? And this is, it's, it's a difficult question, but, you know, and this is sort of, you know, people might have different ideas of what they think midnight is supposed to be like or what it's going to be like. We're expecting, we're expecting America to be defeated by Russia and then in the aftermath, Russia to be defeated by America. Okay. So there, there's these ideas about United States and Russia, but we've abandoned that view, right? So we now recognize that Russia is not the king of the south, that it's it has to do with the globalists. Right. They've taken on that role as as the king of the south. Because it's atheism and Russia is not an atheistic country. It's a it's a Christian country now. So it can't be Russia. Now, we can say, well, the United States is the king of the north. So, you know, apostate Protestantism. Things like that. So you have this, you can say this, it's uh, the dragon power, United Nations. But, but what are we expecting? Are we expecting an actual battle between these powers? Or is there something else going on? 
Because if we look in Millerite history and, and we look at midnight, well, midnight is just midway. It's going to be when Samuel Snow uh, rides his horse into Boston, not doesn't ride it into Exeter, comes into Boston, rides you know from early in the morning, gets there sometime, maybe around noon or so, and he's going to just give a brief message uh, regarding the tenth day of the seventh month. Right? And he's going to say that he's giving the midnight cry, and it's midnight now, not recognizing that it's actually to the day midnight, but. So that's going to be Boston. So he's going to proclaim a message. And then the midnight cry, there's, there's not a battle going on or anything. There's no north against the south. In the midnight cry, there's going to be just the empowerment of this message that Samuel Snow had. So why are we looking at uh, Raphi and Paneum typifying waymarks or being typified by waymarks, however you want to look at it, that occurred in Millerite history called Midnight and the Midnight Cry. Why, why are we attaching this as a battle between the North and the South? How, how does this relate? Because because one really is an external thing that when we're attaching this battle of Raffi, it, it, I don't think it would apply to to something happening within the movement, you know, as far as a battle. So Samuel has no idea. That's good. Good to be honest. So. The way that we understand this is we go back to the Battle of Raphi and the Battle of Paneum in the history of Daniel chapter 11. And we can see that those are typifying 1798 and 1989. Now, if that's true, 1798 and 1989, or Raphi and Paneum, respectively, in what line, right? Normally, we would have 1798 the time of the end. And, you know, maybe this line, we should try drawing it out. But I think it would be in a line where you're going to have the time of the end as something before 1798. And you might even say, well, it's the time of the end for, for Western Rome. Maybe that's, that's the time of the end, you know, and then you have this, this tearing time. And at the end of that tearing time, you're going to have the papacy being taken captive, right? The tearing times, a time of confusion or whatever you want to call it. And then you have Millerite history. That's the period between midnight and the midnight cry. The midnight cry would then be, you know, the message regarding the second coming of Christ or whatever. That that would be the end of the prophetic periods. I mean, you could do something like that. But but the question as to what we are expecting to happen is I don't think we know what's going to happen. That is what midnight and midnight cry are going to look like now. I do think that 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 we would we would need to understand these things as symbols. That is, they are symbolizing something. So raffia has a symbol. Uh, it's in 2017, 2017, 217 BC, not 2017 BC, and that's a symbol of July 21st, the 21st of July. So we have. Uh, this symbol, and we can tie it to Millerite history. But yet nothing in Millerite history happens that's a parallel to the Battle of Raffia that we know of, right, that we, we've, we've addressed. We haven't said, yeah, in Boston is just like Raffia. And yet we've attached the symbol of Raffia to midnight. Now, it could be that when we talk about midnight and the midnight cry in our line, that is the line that that we have from 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, that we shouldn't be expecting the Battle of Raffia at that midnight. It could be that when we started understanding Raffia and its application, that maybe that should just be attached to January 6th, that that, that is a midnight in our line. And it is going to be the Democrats, the King of the South, defeating the Republicans, the king of the north. So there we do have something that is the north and the south. Now, if we were going to have something that's the north and the south, and we were going to mark it as a future date that we call midnight, I mean, who would be the north and who would be the south? It definitely is not going to be Russia and the United States. And I know a lot of people are still trying to look to that. They're trying to look to this Ukrainian war as something to do with Russia and the United States. But Russia is not the king of the south. So 
you need something that that is representative of the king of the south. Now, you could say, well, maybe it's some t- some kind of clash between the UN and the United States, and that would make more sense, right? So, because in a sense, we already have that with January sixth. And, and, and part of what I have seen is that we have seen through wokeism and through, you know, the promotion of the World Economic Forum and their agenda as as something that definitely parallels Raffia. And then the idea is that Paniam would be when the Republicans uh, conquered the Democrats in in much the same way that happened. That is, it's going to end the Democrats. Now, and sometimes we see it, well, maybe it has to do with the civil war in the United States, you know, the North against the South, so to speak, right? So we have lots of different options of, of ways that we could look at it. it. It could have nothing to do with the North and South when we get to the may, way mark midnight. It might just be something that has applied already. And that, because we know the thing about midnight in Millerite history is it's more about a proclamation of a message. So to know exactly what that's going to mean as far as proclaiming a message. Uh, our view is that we're going to have a message that we give to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Right? And there would be some events, you know, such as July 18th, that would have opened up the doors for that to happen. So if we're going to address, you know, this this idea of Rafi and Paniam, you know, they may not necessarily line up with the Midnight and the Midnight Cry in Jeff's line. But they might, right? I'm just saying we don't know. We know that we do have a raffia that we can mark already. And that may just have been where the raffia and Paniam application would line up as being midnight and the midnight cry, having to do with our line internally within this movement, marked by an external event, but not on the big line. So, I mean, that would be the real difference that, that we have in the movement right now, if you want to just uh, take away all the other differences. But uh, in the understanding of the lines, we do not believe we have come to midnight yet. But there is all of this work to do in this movement because we're in a typical line that precedes midnight. In a sense, you can say what we're in right now is the prediction before midnight. We're in Samuel Snow's letters. We're not to Boston yet. Now, Boston is going to be a proclamation of a message to Seventh-day Adventists. And then there's going to be an empowerment of that message later on. And and um, in the empowerment of that message, many, many Adventists are going to join in that message. And that has to all happen before there's a Sunday law. So we have all of these different scenarios that are happening in this movement. And I know I'm making this a little bit confusing for something that's supposed to be simple. <laughs> but, you know, I've been, I've been writing a paper on the eclipse that's coming up in two weeks. And I watched Don Frost's video um, on it, Nineveh and Nashville. I watched part one and part two. Now, he's working for Amazing Discoveries now, which I, I find odd. That they could take him seriously, but but anyway, there's a lot of people who are looking at uh, these different events like eclipses and, and wars that are going on and presenting sort of scenarios of how they think things are going to happen. And that's happening within the movement as well. Right. So Jeff is is making suggestions about the war with Ukraine and so forth. And, you know, Trump becoming elected and, and, you know, what's going to happen. So Trump is coming back, you know, there's all of these speculations. How do we avoid getting caught up in these speculations? Because they're tempting. You know, you, you know, if you start looking into this eclipse and the you know, eclipse back in 2017, and you start looking at, you know, previous eclipse and the earthquake, you know, new, um, new Madrid back in, uh, 1811, you know, things like that. You, you look at the eclipse that happened just before that. You know, people have all these kinds of speculations. So what, what's, what's, got, what's keeping us on the, on the correct course here? By the right understanding of lines. Okay. So, so we have an understanding of lines. Okay. So that, 
That's extremely important. That is, we, we have accepted the light in the past and, and that light in the past is giving us in our history a structure that we can now look at and we can say, well, I know we haven't gone to this point yet, right? But, but we know that the Sunday law is not just around the corner this summer or something like that, or this, you know, winter or, right? It, there are so many things that have to happen, so much work that needs to be done. And then, of course, we have, you know, this eclipse is going to go over Nashville. Last time it went over Memphis, the one in 2017. This one's going to go through Tennessee as well, but it's going to, it's going to, they're going to experience it in Nashville. So Memphis and Nashville are both these, uh, uh, important centers for country music of some sort. You know, and then of course we got the, the Parthenon in Nashville and we have Ellen White's prophecy about the destruction of Nashville. And so, you know, we could create a scenario and say, well, you know, what's going to happen is sometime after this uh, eclipse, there's going to be maybe an earthquake and, and maybe, you know, maybe Nashville is going to be destroyed by a fireball that might happen. And, then, you know, Trump will be put as the head of the United States and he's going to bring in a Sunday law. I mean, we could create scenarios like that. But is that what we're supposed to do? No. No. And, and we know that because of our experience and the lines that we've, that we have, right? That is, if we get rid of those lines, you know, and, and I don't fully understand Jeff's statement where he said, you know, the biggest mistake or the first mistake or whatever that we made was looking at this midnight way mark. So the midnight, may, midnight way mark was a huge mistake. Um, you know, if we get rid of that, we have no foundation to stand on, right? We could just start speculating left and right. We could say, well, we can't time set, but we could be, you know, event setting. You know, Trump's going to bring in the Sunday law. Trump's going to become a dictator. Uh, this is, that's going to happen between, you know, the Russians and the war in Ukraine. And, and, but they would all be speculation. Like there would not be anything solid for us uh, to build on. And, and people do this all the time. You know, Don Frost does it all the time. You know, he, he creates some scenario. Things don't work out that way. Well, you know, he's, you know, he, he keeps his options open too, the way that he does it. But we know that God has been leading us and that we can't abandon this. So when we have these three different interpretations of this text, they, they give us something quite solid. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, we can, we can establish that 1989 and 1798 are connected. We can, we, we can establish that our understanding of Daniel 11 verse 40 is correct, that it's already witnessed to earlier in Daniel chapter 11, something that we had never noticed before. And then we can, we can now evaluate these lines based upon our own history that we have passed through. So I, I guess the thing that I want to do, so here we have up at, up at the top of this page here, we have the present truth application up to verse 28. Now, we're saying that this history in verse 29 is talking about our history, but that we can examine this in the context of not just the broader line, but a narrower line, right? So if we're going to take November 9th, 1989, we know that this is going to uh, parallel November 9th, 2019. Can we agree on that? And in doing that, we can see that there is going to be a battle that occurs. Now, in this case, so we're, we're taking November 9th, 2019. Does the, does the king of the north come against the king of the south on November 9th, 2019? Now, here it's, you know, the papacy in the USA is the king of the north. Uh, he shall return and come toward the south. So what happens in this movement on November 9th, 2019? How could we take this and make an application to our history? We, we talked about it a little bit, you know, a week or so ago. It's when we go to the of, of ministry, you know, a ministry like of ministering as Christ was grown up and then he could, like he had freedom to go and start preaching. Like, that's what happened on November 9th, 2019. Okay, so what we have is the 30 years, 
right? Christ Christ is now baptized. That's what you're saying. He's he can be the high priest or be a priest. Yeah. Okay. He begins his ministry. Okay. So on November 9th, 2019, uh, we're going to have a battle between the North and the South as well. So normally we would look at the North, you know, they're, they're neither necessarily good or bad. Okay. They're both, you know, Greece initially, right? You're going to be the apostate Protestantism and the Soviet Union and Apostate Protestantism connected with the papacy, so it's obviously that's why it's apostate. It's not really Protestantism. Um, being the king of the north, but if we were going to put it into our history, we'd have to say this is FFA. That is, FFA is going to come against a Parminder's movement. You know, we could have said you know Alpha and Omega and so on, so forth, but I just rather put Parminder in here. Now remember, we also have. Uh, the prophetic mirror. I'm just going to also put Tess. Hello, excuse me. But I, yeah. I, I, think, I think the collision between FFA and Pamina's movement came, came after November 9, 2019. Uh, came after? Well, it's going to happen before, right? Parminder and Tess are going to be before November 9th, 2019. So they're going to be... Um, you know, because that's going to be like August 29th, 2019. They have the rebellion and so forth. But what All I'm right. saying, yeah. right? So what I'm saying is that FFA is going to, you know, we could, you know, we could put even like September 7th. It kind of begins. But I'm just going to put that this is sort of the showdown. This is the date that was set that parallels it, and and they're going to be defeated. That is, Parminder and Tess are going to be defeated in our lines. But then it says it shall not be as the former. Now, so in order to understand what the former would be and the latter, that would be obviously different. We're not going to be going back to Egypt, you know, in 30 BC being defeated. Uh, there would have to be something earlier in our movement. Now, that's why this last one is where it says, and the latter shall not be as the former. That is, uh, the former would have been 1989 but you know north and south aren't reversed so we'd have to you know we would have something like that it's in internal not external something like that so in each one of these uh, we could probably make an application of of the latter and the former but the basic idea here is that um we have this wokeism this is the the south this is a type of atheism we'll call it that a worldliness that FFA is going to attack. Now, FFA, and it, it's not, doesn't mean FFA is good or bad, right? We're, because we're talking about the papacy in the USA. One of the ways in that they're reversed though is in the civil war. That's the point I was going back to. Remember, we have a civil war in 742 BC. It's the North against the South. And who's Confederate? So the North. Yeah, yeah, the North is going to be Confederate. And in, in 1863, Who's going to be Confederate? The South. The South. Right? So there's a reversal happening. And and so here you can kind of see that there's, if, if you're going to compare uh, this, it would just say that there is a reversal in the sense of of North and South, just like you would have in that, um, that comparison, like who's Confederate. So here we have Parminder and Tess instead of, where the North is going to have the papacy in the USA. It has two. In this case, the king of the South, the USSR, has one, but Parminder and Tess have two. Does that make sense? Like there's a combined of two, you know, because you got uh, two combined in the above one, papacy in the US, but it's not FFA and somebody else. And in the South, which is just one, the USSR, now we have the two, Parminder and Tess. And, and that would be a way which it's the the latter is not as the former. And so you'd just be comparing the present truth application with the literal or the historical application. So that, that's the way that I would do that. Now, all this is addressing is that that history, right? It's going to address November 9, 2019. It's not going to address the rest of the line in verse 29. So when we get to verse 30, you know, and it says, um, in which uh, the ships of Kittim 
shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return into indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, there's two things happening here. He's going to return, have indignation against the Holy Covenant. And then, so shall he do. And then it says, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So historically, obviously, this is the persecution of Christians. And then the intelligence or the communication of this working with apostate Christianity. So we have two groups here, uh, the Holy Covenant, that's God's true church, and those that forsake the Holy Covenant. So first, paganism is going to persecute Christians, but then it's also going to have intelligence with this other group that professes to be Christians. Now, how would we apply this in a present truth sense? So we, we, we looked at, at verse 29. So now we get to verse 30. And what parallel would the ships of Kittim have to do with our history? Are we going to just bring this into our history? Are we going to continue verse 29 with verse 30? that's saying that this has to do with something within our movement. And, and what would the ships of Kitten, how would they parallel something that happened to our movement? And then, you know, Western Rome, what is Western Rome typified? Is that typifying some aspect of our movement? You know, are we going to do that? Or are we going to take this and bring it in the broader context? That is, are we going to sort of, separate this from verse 29 and just have this as applying historically or not, not historically, but in the present truth sense, taking this history of the fall of pagan Rome and paralleling with the fall of the United States more directly. Right. That's, that's what we would have to decide. So I like to think that verse 29 is parenthetical, that it's, it's not, really connected to the flow of these prophecies in the way that um, that we would just take it and put it into a line. It's just going to typify this history, which we call 1989 or November 9th, 1989. It's going to uh, take that history and it's going to typify our history just, just in a, in a very, you know, it's not going to go through the detail of it. It's not going to deal with July 18th. It's not going to deal with December 25th. It's not going to deal with anything else. It's just it, that that's the only way that I could parallel it. I can't I can't create a new line with verse 29. But you can see how this would fit in in the context of what we're we're talking about in these in the other present truth applications. We can just see that November 9th has this role that is. This And November 9th is really about all of this addressing July 18th and December 25th. It's just not the line because verse 29 is not part of the line, right? It's it's looking way into the future to the time of the end in our history. And it's just put in there, right, to to address the fact that there is this his, this history is going to be repeated. It's, it's telling you about Daniel 11 verse 40b. Because the first part's going to tell you about Daniel 11, verse 40a. Okay. So then when we get to verse 30, we are starting a new line. Now, it's going to be the fall of pagan Rome. And verse 31 is going to give us the rise of papal Rome historically. But those would have to be paralleled in our history. And so we would have to figure out, well, what's the rise of papal Rome paralyzed, par uh, paralleling? It's probably paralyzed in something too but um and then what is the fall of of pagan rome symbolizing okay so because we need to have a present truth application at least that's what we believe so the simple thing is we're going to say uh, the ships of kitten what are they going to parallel in our history now you could say well i'm just going to go back here so we know that this is 1989 but this is telling us something about the future but it could just be telling us that these verses here, verses 30 and onward, are history that's going to be repeated in 1989. So it could be telling us that these ships of Kittim coming against Western Rome are typifying something that's going to happen in 1989. 
Does that make sense? I mean, we, we already believe that, right? Well, Ellen White, she has already commented it and said saying this history was is going to be repeated. Yeah, and all I'm saying is that verse 29 is telling us that. Verse 27 to 29. So the history that's going to be repeated is, is this history that's going to be described. And that's going to be, as verse 29 is telling us, it, is that this is that repeat of history. It's November 9th, 1989. So it's telling us that the present truth application of verse 30 is 1989. Would you agree with that, Stephen? I don't see any relation to 1989 in the verse. In verse 29 or in verse 30? Verse 30. Okay, so what what are the ships of Kitten? How okay, we're gonna have the fall of of Western Rome, right? Yes. So what is Western Rome symbolized? United States. Okay. So it's good it's gonna represent the United States. What aspect of the United States? Are you gonna want to have the ships of Kitten to have do you want to have all of this address the Sunday law? Or is it going to address the history leading up to the Sunday law? Well, I see it as uh, relating to the formation. Of the image of the beast. Okay. So the formation of the in- image of the beast. And when does that start? Well, I suppose you could maybe relate it to Ronald Dragon. Okay. Right. So and then when I, so that's what I'm saying. Now, when I say 1989, I don't mean the year 1989. Right. I just mean that history that that marks the beginning of 1989, the time of the end. Does that make sense? Right. Okay. Okay. Now, so we're, we're going to take, we know that the ships of Kittim are these Germanic tri- tribal invasions. And I didn't see any Germanic tribal invasions happening in that history. Uh, but we're not looking for literally uh, Germanic tribal invasions. Th- this has to typify something. Uh, so what do the ships of Kittim uh, symbolize in our history? Well, they, they are a trumpet power. So they okay. signify the trumpet power in our history. Okay, and what's the trumpet power? It's the seventh trumpet. Okay, the so seventh trumpet, which, which sounds October 22nd, 1844. It began then, yes. Yeah, it began then. So are you going to attach it to the wool? 9-11. Okay, so, so we do have 9-11, but and we mark 9-11, that's going to be a restraint of Islam, right? Has was Islam involved prior to 9/11? Yes. Yeah. Right. So we know that that Islam is part of that history, and you know we we can you know we can go to the Soviet Afghan War, you know, say 1979, but in the 1970s we already have these disturbances occurring. So I mean, is there some way that we can attach the, the ships of Kittim to Islam? Is there a way to do that? Well, America was initially supporting Islam Mm -hmm. against their war against Russia. Yeah. 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 And and, I mean, Islam is a broad thing. There are different factions and so forth. But so we have, uh, let me see here. So I don't remember the years of all this, but okay. So the first thing that you're going to have is the Ayatollah Khomeini back in the 1970s. Now, exactly how did he, I mean, Dwight might remember some of this history better because he's older than me and and paid more attention than I did. Uh, But we're going to have the Ayatollah Khomeini. So that's that's in Iran, right? Yes. Correct. And and there's going to be, so we're going to have the start of Islamic terrorism occurring. Now, I mean, it's in the news, but it's, it's not directly affecting us. I mean, you would hear about airplanes being hijacked or bombings happen. And there would be the odd thing here and there. But, I mean, it's not really till 9-11 that they really catch our attention. Even the bombing of the World Trade Center in, in 1993 on February 26th, uh, because it, it's so soon, Waco followed two days later, it sort of drew our attention away from Islam. Everybody forgot about it. It, it, it wasn't, you know, if, if people had paid more attention, uh, to the investigation that followed and, and so forth, you know, there might have been uh, a lot more interest um, in what was happening. 
and and much more concern about Islam. But you know, it's not going to be until 2001 that really uh, the fear strikes everyone. Okay, so um, you know, some of this stuff we're going to have to you know, look at tomorrow in a lot more detail. So we'll just try to keep it more uh, general here. So so we can say that this that this is part of the fall of the United States. That the ships of Kittim can represent uh, Islam. Now is now you know obviously there's not a direct correlation in the sense of the area and so forth because Kittim this is going to be in the Mediterranean. Islam's way over you know, further east. I mean they do take over that lot of that territory later on, but we're not making those connect geographical locations. We're just saying that there is that that Western Rome's going to fall and they're going to have a trumpet power that comes in and causes them to fall. And Islam is going to be a trumpet power as well, right? It's going to be under the trumpets. And so we, we can apply that parallel. Now, in, in this case, then it says, um, shall come against him. And then therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So one is you see three things here, the grieving, the returning and the indignation. So what do we notice about these three things? What's the most obvious thing about these three things? The indignation. Okay. Well, the first obvious thing is there's three of them. Yeah. So so we have this indignation. And we know the indignation here is going to be the 1260 years. Um, but we have three things. Grieved, return, and indignation. So that represents three angels' messages, right? All right. And I'm doing something here at the same time. Um, okay, so we got this, um, these three. So could we apply these as the three angels' messages in our time? Could we put grieved as November 9th, 1989 as the return as September 11th, 2001 and the indignation as the Sunday law? So could we do that? How would, how would we address these three? How would we place them in our history? Is there some other way that we could take this? Um, so the one thing is, you know, added up, uh, grieved return and indignation. And I get this number, uh, one, three, four, three, one. So it's a, you know, it's the reverse, right? One, three, four, three, one. Now that's a period of 36 years and, 282 days. I don't know. What, what can we connect it to? I mean, if we're going to have the ships of Kittim. Is there some date that we can connect it to it in, in that history? I mean, the start of the Afghan war, I tried. That's just going to bring us to the first day of the seventh month in 2016. If I count from the start of the, uh, the war in 1979, December 26. It's December 26th the war starts. I think it's um, 24th. 24th. Yeah. So so it's the 24th. Yeah. So that would just bring us to the uh, 28th day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar in 2016, October 1st. So so I don't see any. Is there some other event that we would mark as the ships of Kittim? I mean, maybe there's some some other attack that occurs. Uh, what's what's the first Islamic? There is November fifth, nineteen ninety. Yeah, what is this? Yeah, so you know, I tried February twenty sixth, nineteen ninety three. Well, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow and just try to figure out how we're going to mark this. Okay, so if I go backwards from April fifth, twenty thirty. 13,431 days. It brings me to June 26, 1993. That's the number of days between these two dates. And in 1993, on June 26, Bill Clinton ordered U.S. warships stationed in the Persian Gulf and in the Red Sea to launch Tomahawk cruise missiles against the headquarters of the Iraqi intelligence service in downtown Baghdad. So I don't know much about that that history but maybe maybe we could look at that tomorrow see if that we can make some kind of connection whether, whether that's important or not okay let's close with prayer 
Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, and we just pray for your continued presence throughout this day. I pray for each person who's been studying and looking for truth that you can guide them. We ask for your angels' care and protection over our loved ones, and that you can give us strength for the trials that we face each day. We ask that we can continue to study and to understand these things and to make a correct application. And uh, bring us together again according to thy will, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.